You know, I know there's some things that are really impossible to get these days, and probably the first thing that comes to mind are items that are made of paper or cereal or things of that nature. But, you know, if you try to go down and buy a webcam right now, you can't find a webcam anywhere, online or even, uh, even at Walmart. And, um, and so uh, a lot of people are getting uh, connected uh, online, even people that never did so uh, before, and spending a lot of time at home and spending time in uh, reflection. And uh, I've been reading a lot of those. People have been posting those uh, online. And this one came from an old... Uh, a uh, Bible professor of mine, uh, William Lambert. In fact, uh, our youngest son, William, is named after him. And I just wanted to share this uh, thought that he shared uh, a few days ago online. And he titled it, uh, Thoughts on Being Shut In or Social Distancing. He writes, Most of us feel cooped up during these weeks of social distancing. We miss doing the things we feel we've just got to do and feel bored. But when we look at the whole picture, we might discover that we are rediscovering some things far more valuable than anything we are losing. Someone once said, maybe God has gotten tired of our being so bad that he has sent us to our rooms. Uh, and I'm thinking, maybe God has decided we need a time out to force us to rethink a few things. Many are reestablishing and strengthening relationships that have been crowded out by pressing matters that rob us of time for family, friends, neighbors, and God. Maybe it is forcing us to return to the important that has been crowded out by the urgent. Husbands are discovering again just how amazing their wives are. Wives are discovering qualities in their husbands that have long been hidden under stuff they both thought they just had to do. Children are enjoying their parents having time to talk to them, to play with them, to listen to them. Husbands and wives and parents and children are rekindling relationships. Relationships once aflame with communication, love, laughter, play and happiness that have been snuffed out to barely a dying ember. Neighbors are rediscovering each other. In some cases, discovering each other for the first time. Neighbors are reaching out to each other. Some Christians are reaching out to and helping one another and others more than ever. We are suddenly aware that we do need each other. I know we are thrilled as we look at the long list of fellow Christians, friends, neighbors, and family members who have offered to help us in so many ways. We have been made sharply aware that we need each other. The Greek word for one another is used about 100 times in the New Testament, and so many of us are being forced into the reality that Christianity is a one another religion. I think that above all, we have been made aware that there are some things we cannot handle alone. No man is an island. We also are reminded some problems are so great that human strength alone cannot deal with them, regardless of how many of us there are, how much money we have, or how much power we have. So maybe the present crisis will cause us to thirst for God. As the psalmist says in the 63rd Psalm, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. As I said in response to a posting by a good friend concerning this pandemic, suffering and dealing with problems beyond our control are some of our best teachers. The wise will learn valuable lessons from the pandemic we face. The greatest lessons we will likely learn is to depend on the power that transcends this world and live more for the life beyond this world than for the life in this world. Oh, some of the messages that we have been reflecting on have been a uh, great blessing and a time of growth for so many of us. And I appreciate my uh, 
brother uh, Bill for sharing that with us uh, online, and I just wanted to share that with you because it was a uh, a time to pause and uh, and to look at this from a different perspective. Um, let's go ahead and, and pray, Father, as we uh, consider everything that's going on around us. Father, may we pause and consider that perhaps there is a message that you're whispering in our ear uh, through all of this. Father, may we slow down enough not only to enjoy the more important things in life that we find at home, but may we also slow down enough to listen to your still voice and to, uh, to reach for the wisdom that you offered to us in times such as this. And Father, we thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. I have been reflecting on uh, grace over the last uh, few days, and that's been the topic of our uh, Sunday morning class up until recently. And it occurred to me as I was uh, reading through some passages on grace that receiving God's grace is kind of like getting a new pair of glasses. And I remember the very first time that I uh, got my first pair of glasses, I was astounded at how differently the world looked around me and how everything came with such clarity. And as I was uh, looking at these passages uh, concerning grace, I realized that's exactly what God's grace does for us, uh, whether it's in, uh, at a time when everything seems to be going well or at a challenging time such as this. God grace, God's grace gives us uh, sharp clarity through times such as this. And so I want to share three brief points this morning concerning grace that, from the passages that I've read. And number one comes from the first chapter of John, grace demonstrated by Christ. John chapter 1, after uh, declaring that Jesus was there from the beginning, that Jesus is God, that He is our Creator, that He is the Word of God that created all things. In verse 14 of John chapter 1 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who was at the Father's side has made him known. This may not be one of the first passages that come to mind when we think about grace, but as I was reading through this passage, uh, I realized that the word grace is actually used four times in this paragraph. So this is a grace passage as well, and it reminds us that Jesus himself is full of grace and truth. And I just want to focus on the two different ways this passage points out that he demonstrated it. He demonstrated his grace by becoming flesh and living among us. Think about that, what that might have been like for Jesus. He left the safety of heaven and came to this world with all of its danger, with all of its trouble, with all of its infestation. He didn't stay in heaven from his protective cocoon, um, but he actually came uh, to a place that was full of danger. I remember uh, when my uh, boys were little, we went to Niagara Falls. And as we were walking close to the edge of the falls, uh, I don't remember which boy I was, I was holding one of them. I think it was Jeremy. Dad, you're hurting my hand. And I didn't realize how tightly I was grasping his hand because we were just a few feet from the edge. And I could, my, my worry was somehow he would trip and fall over the edge. And uh, so I was acutely aware of the danger there. And that's kind of the way it was for Jesus. When he came into the world, he was surrounded by all kinds of danger. The creator, creator of the world became weak. He became vulnerable. He became susceptible to temptation. And so that's one way he just demonstrated his grace was by coming down personally. That's the second point. He has made God known personally. Now, if you had an important message that you wanted to send into an infested, hostile uh, place, what would you do? 
Maybe we might drop leaflets from a plane, right? And, uh, make st- and hopefully everyone would get a copy of those leaflets. Maybe we would send the message in through uh, Morse code. Or maybe we would beam radio waves in. Or maybe get a little bit more personal. We might go in with some kind of troop carrier or a, you know, a Humvee or, or a tank and loudspeaker the message to everyone. But you know what? Jesus did none of those things. He came personally to the epicenter of our world and he ministered personally to our wounds, to our sicknesses, to our sin, and uh, even uh, died for us. And ultimately he died not on a battlefield but on a cross for us. He was full of grace and truth and these are a couple of the ways that he demonstrated it. So that's grace demonstrated by Christ. The second point is grace demonstrated by Christ us. The passage says that we have received from his fullness grace upon grace. What does that look like in our lives? And here's a couple of other passages. There's a bunch of them, but I want to share these two passages that shows us what this looks like in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10. In fact, this was a memory verse that Larry uh, reminded us uh, during our uh, class on grace. But by the grace of God... I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. By the grace of God, I am what I am. What am I by the grace of God? He says, God's grace did not prove to be in vain for me. Uh, Vain means empty. It wasn't empty. Um, It it filled me up and transformed me into a devoted follower of Christ. And he said, it didn't cause me to be lazy, to do nothing. But he says, I worked even harder. But his motivation wasn't to try and measure up. His motivation was his love and devotion for God. And so it turned his life right side up. Um, And so uh, grace transforms us into God's devoted servant who works joyfully, full of emotional and spiritual energy, not uh, out of a sense of self-centered sense of trying to measure up, but out of love and devotion. The second passage is 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. This is where Peter says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as stewards of God's varied grace. Stewards of God's grace. This passage is talking about serving one another. This passage is talking about ministry. And it says all of us are stewards of what God has granted to us. Stewards of what? Of God's varied grace, or your translation may say manifold grace, or grace in its various forms. And so he came from heaven to earth to minister to us for our good, and that was his grace in action. And now we do the same sort of thing. Grace in action in our life is to do the same thing, to do as Christ did. And the third point is grace... That overcomes the world. Grace that overcomes the world. You know what the root idea or the root meaning of the word grace is? It means favor. And so when we receive God's grace, it means we receive His favor. He favors you, He favors us. And that means that he is faithful toward you, that means He loves you, that means He will never leave you. And there's two passages from 2 Corinthians that express this sentiment that uh, I want to look at briefly. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. It says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. Paul's talking about all the great revelations that he's received from God and the potential of becoming prideful about it. So to keep me from becoming conceited, he says, A thorn was given me in the flesh... A messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace 
is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, he says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. A messenger of Satan was given to me to harass me, he says. Now, if that were to happen to you, what would you do? If there was a messenger of Satan that was harassing you, whatever it is, <clears throat> whether it's something physical, something emotional, something financial, whatever it is, what would you do? The first thing we say we should do is do what? Pray. And that's exactly what he did. <clears throat> that's the first thing we should do is pray. Lord, please deliver me from this. Lord, please take it away. <clears throat> and so he prays in this way and he prays diligently not just one time but says he prays three times and what is God's answer yeah no I'm not taking this away you have everything that you need he says my grace is sufficient for you you have all that you need and, uh, and Paul realized, whatever this messenger of Satan was to harass him, that this was something that God was actually using in his life for good. Maybe he understood that this was God's hammer and chisel to continue to shape his inner self into the beauty and the glory of God. And of course, when a hammer and chisel is applied to our heart, it's not always a pleasant uh, experience. But we know that in the end, what we have is going to be something that's magnificent, something that is beautiful. And so, his response... When, when his Lord says, okay, you've got everything you need. My grace is sufficient for you. My favor is sufficient for you. I am still with you. I am working in your life through this thing. His response is not complaining, but his response is thankfulness. God has given me all that I need. It's not health. It's not financial well-being. It's not physical comfort. All of those things are nice, but what I ultimate, ultimately need, it's God's everlasting eternal grace and his grace continues to work in my life even through things such as this that brings me to the next passage from second Corinthians chapter chapter 4 second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 14 and here's a perspective that grace gives us ultimately verse 14 knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal and so his grace in our life extends from us to others, the passage says, and the result is thanksgiving. Not fear, not anger, not disbelief, not complaining, but the ultimate result is thanksgiving, just as Paul demonstrated uh, when he talked about his thorn in the flesh that God had uh, allowed him to have. So even in the midst of a danger, even in the midst of a disaster, grace still moves us to thanksgiving. And we, the pastor says, we do not lose heart no matter what happens. Financially, health-wise, uh, uh, wars, violence, persecution, whatever it is, we do not lose heart. Why? Because... Um, because of the perspective that we have. We compare what we have here and the eternal weight of glory which is waiting for us, which doesn't even compare with, with what's going on here. We look to the 
unseen, not to the seen. We're not focusing squarely on our financial woes. We're not focusing squarely and solely on a, a sickness, but we're f focusing on God's promises which are eternal. The things of this earth, whether it's a virus, whether it's finances, those things are transitory. Those things are temporary, but uh, God's promises are eternal. And so what this means for us is that the precautions we take, just a few minutes ago, my wife uh, reached over with, with a little bit of hand sanitizer so I could put it on my hand. It means that those precautions that we take, we do so out of love rather than fear. You know, uh, some police cars have uh, to protect and to serve on the side of their car. That's exactly the sort of thing that we're doing by taking these uh, precautions. It allows us to protect others so that we don't wind up uh, uh, spreading to someone else. And it also it allows us to continue to be well enough to where we can serve others when the need arises as well. We're focused on serving others in the name of Christ even as we take precautions. Doctors continue to serve in their own way. Medical professionals continue to serve in their own way. Uh, truck drivers are still delivering the things that we need, mail carriers, and as Christians, we perform our Christian uh, ministry uh, as well. And some of us have been dropping off food to those people who should not get out that are at higher risk. Uh, some of us have been calling to encourage people. Some of us have been sending uh, encouraging texts and uh, doing what we can in order to continue to minister to other people. And what motivates us to this is the love and the grace of Christ. And that's grace in action in our life. I'm reminded of the uh, hymn, Grace Tis a Charming Sound. And it occurs to me that uh, when, things get really, when things get really difficult, uh, grace is what brings out the finest in us. We see this in Christ when he left heaven and came to earth and uh, came to this world and ultimately died for our sins, was buried and rose up from the grave. And he did that in order to provide you what you ultimately, your ultimate need, which is redemption and reformation, which he grants to us through his ministry. And if you have not uh, accepted him as your Lord and as your Savior, uh, and you accept that he died on the cross for your sins, and that he rose from the grave, and you're ready to accept his lordship over your life, and you're ready to accept him in baptism and to be born again. And if you've already done that, then remember the promises that God has attached to his grace. And I'm going to end with these two promises uh, that God has made to us attached to his grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency... In all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work. And then 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal joy in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Do you see how receiving God's grace is like receiving a new pair of glasses? Think about these things and be encouraged.